So on the quality assurance, based on the discussions last time of that, that checklist of calibration and maintenance things that people have been trying out, um, what we wanted to do is kind of have a chance to revisit that. Um, how have you been implementing quality assurance and what have the challenges been? And then what we can do is then revisit that checklist and talk about what things are essential, um, what level of calibration or how, off, how frequently do you need to calibrate um, to ensure quality results, for example. So I'm going to turn it to you guys now to talk about your experiences. Um, I'm going to stop talking now. And, and this is really a chance for you guys to share what you've been doing and um, share some of the challenges that you've had. I just wanted to share a few things about uh, things that we're doing new. Something that we're doing new is, uh, OK, so we're trying to develop many stoves right now at Apervetra. And uh, it, there's a lot of tests that happen. And so we, we always have uh, a data sheet where we write, we write down the, you know, the parameters of the test. But something new is we've written a, we now write hypotheses for each test. So we say, uh, you know, we're running this test. What do we expect it to do? And so that's, that's why uh, at the end of the test, was it very different than what we expected? And is that good or is that bad? And uh, that's kind of something that we're being more careful with these days. And uh, I guess just some general things that I, I wanted to bring up for how to make sure that data is, is uh, of a high quality is understanding what the equipment is capable of, the, the tools that we're using to measure. What, uh, there, are some, there are in some cases where the tools can't measure what we're trying to measure, and so that will give us a bad result. And so uh, everyone has to know what the tools are capable of. Another, another general point is uh, when we're analyzing the data, if we use software, uh, that's if, if, if you receive software from somebody else and you don't know how it's constructed, then uh, that's not good. Um, when performing calculations, you have to understand what is inside the software. And so I have a few other minor points, but I, I just uh, wanted to share that, those kind of larger topics. Thanks, Sam. Has anyone been doing anything similar or other? OK. Uh, well, uh, like I said, uh, we're working together with uh, Sensico Laboratory and Stop Testing Center in La Paz. So we found that we need two kinds of uh, quality assurance. We have the uh, procedures of the lab. So that means that we need documents. We need register, we need checklist, we need the procedures uh, right to write the procedures. We need a document, the official document of the lab. That's the quality assurance for the procedures. Then we need the quality assurance for the data, for the results how to analyze the results, how to analyze the statistics of the results, how to analyze the uncertainty, how to report the value of the, of the test. So we, have, we need two parts of quality assurance. That we, that's what we found in our experience. So we are working now in to develop the manual, the, 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 the procedures for the labs, uh, obviously, we need the procedure for the water volume test, but we need the procedures for the calibration. We need the procedures for the for uh, the checklist. For the procedures to to buy some uh, equipment and uh, and so on. We we need the procedures, and we are working at the, at the same time and how to analyze the results. So in in this part, we are working with with a tool that we found in, in our experience that is the control charts. I, I don't know if you, if you know the, 
the typical procedures in the, to, to have quality control in, in, in the factory. You have quality uh, control charts. You have lob levels, the low level and the high level. And you can use these charts to put your, your test results in the charts and to know if you are inside the bounds, to know if, if your test is okay. So I have some examples here. I don't know if, you, if, we, if we can Yeah, you can show, you can show them. Um, to share do you need a, if you okay. copy it onto this, we can get it onto the screen. Okay. And while we do that, um, I know some of the other labs have been looking into ISO 17,025 certification. Um, so if, if people want to discuss their experiences with that. Um, but I think the, one of the main questions that I remember from North Carolina was that we had, we had seen what, what Jim and Seth and their whole team does at EPA. EPA has really stringent requirements with this. But then there's a level somewhere um, with, with less in place that would be appropriate for for other settings, but where where is the where do we draw the line? How do we make sure that we have enough um, steps in place to make sure there's quality, but that we're not asking too much of places that are more resource constrained or there are more challenges working in those regions? Um, so, any experiences? With, with that. Let, let's just talk about calibration to make it easier. Are there, what are the challenges that people have been having with calibration? What level of calibration um, do you think is feasible and reasonable to do? Well, on our side, the challenges is to get the calibration gases first. Uh, since uh, one year now, we are looking at provider in the region. Uh, we just found one, and we will get the calibration gases in a few weeks. Uh, but it's very expensive. And uh, on what we discussed uh, in US uh, at the last uh, training uh, workshop, uh, and what we see at uh, US EPA lab, it's definitely not possible for us to do calibration every day, and even twice a day. Uh, so we don't know yet how we do. I think we are going to, to try to uh, calibrate every week or so every month and see if there is a deviation and uh, try to identify the best uh, uh, frequency. Um, I remember we had found a company in the UK that, that shipped worldwide. Mm -hmm. Is that the one you used or was there a different one? I don't know, but it's, uh, yeah, it's expensive. And Seth, I heard through the grapevine that you had some ideas for possible lower cost calibration. Is that right? Am I remembering right? Uh, yeah, just kind of as a general check. Um, but Jim is going to talk about that um, at greater length and detail with some examples during his presentation later on. So. But we did, we've, we've kind of brainstormed and, and come up with what we think will be a cheaper way to at least do a baseline check of your system to see if there's some sort of gross leak or if, um, you know, at least your CO2 sensor is close to where it should be. Um, but Jim will talk about that a lot later. Maybe this was on your list, but one option that might be more feasible uh, would be using permeation tubes, which emit uh, different gases at a constant rate and you can adjust with flow how much you're getting and they're just small packs. Um, I don't know if they're often used in this. They're, they're used in remote locations sometimes, but it might be an option for at least a, a quick check for some people. That sounds really good. <laughs> um, <coughs> Well, there are issues of cost and availability, but I want to talk about, I want to take this opportunity to talk about the type of calibration uh, 
because when the limbs were set up in our life and we were taught about the calibration, uh, it was not, we were not changing the way it reacts to the certain level of concentration of gases, but we were changing the way it understands its reaction to the concentration of gases, which in that uh, specific, fa specific factor um, it uses. So over time, won't it limit the range over which the system can um, show the level of gases or concentration? Yeah, we're um, we're talking about calibrations where, uh, yeah, there's the the sensor might become more or less sensitive, and so we have to have a, a gas with known concentration that, um, so that yeah, the gas has a known concentration, and when the sensor is calibrated, it puts out some voltage. And if the sensor is becoming more or less sensitive, it, it puts a different voltage for that same concentration. Is that what you're trying to do? Yes, exactly. Um, so let's say for X amount of a certain gas, it, shows a y con uh, it produces a Y voltage. Yeah. And the Y is multiplied by, let's say, A. And it, is the, it rates as AY. And sometime later, the X, for X, it shows Z. And we change, we do not change the Z to Y, but we change the A to a certain factor, let's say B, so that uh, the readings are same. So over time, uh, as it loses its value or its properties, won't it limit the range of which it can report the concentration of gases? Yeah. Okay, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, the the CO2, uh, the, the the carbon monoxide sensor that's used in the lamps, it's a it's a dependent on a chemical process and it does have a lifetime um, but we've gone I think three years and still working and it can be easily replaced um, it's so small that the shipping cost is is minimal a slightly different uh, aspect and particularly I'd like Jim to respond and maybe somebody from Aprovecho side. How frequently should we clean the duct where we have fitted all our equipment for CO, CO2 or particulate matter? I mean, my experience is I did it uh, after a year and I found a lot of soot deposited in the duct. So I'd like to see others' experiences. So, um, so the question is, how often should we clean the inside of the duct? And um, if you check the background levels, you're, you're measuring uh, the background CO, the background CO2, and you can take a, a filter sample where you're just putting clean air through the system and measuring the, the PM. So if your background levels are low and you're not having any problems with the, with the background, um, then you really don't need to clean the, the system. But you may, if you find a lot of soot on the inside of the ducts, you might want to clean it anyway just because you don't want it to be too dirty. But um, we, we have not cleaned our system yet, but it's probably time for us to clean too. Yeah, I would agree that uh, one of the metrics that we have is for when to clean the system, for when to clean the the, the laser chamber for measuring PM, we monitor the background, and, uh, and so we clean it when the background gets higher. And, but as far as the duct work, maybe there's more particles getting deposited when it's dirty, and uh, so we just kind of lean in and look and see if it's dirty, but, but also to clean it when you clean the other sensors. That's the general guideline that we're using. Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, I think that uh, these questions are related with procedures control, uh, quality control for procedures for cleaning sensors, for calibration. And this example is for uh, quality control of your results, okay, after the test. So uh, this example is for water boiling test that we can use for emission, emission test uh, and and it's the same logic, but uh, we we have here 
some example for historical data coming from water volume test. Okay, you have a lab and you have a lot of data coming from others testing maybe the, the last six months, okay? So we can, uh, we can take the, the best, the best uh, results coming from one, uh, one bottle bo water boiling test, uh, one day, another day, another day. And we have, by example, this is the, the efficient, thermal efficiency for, for cold, for cold, okay? So, and why we need the historical data? That's because we need to know how good is our lab uh, in terms of the standard de deviation, in terms of the dispersion of our results. So we can use this uh, value that we call the standard or the deviation or the dispersion of the lab, okay? We have, a, we have a calculations here that we can show later, very, very clear, but this is the, the concept. We need to know how is our dispersion of our lab, the historical dispersion of our lab. So this value we can compare with, uh, with another value that is the, theoretic, the theoretical value. As this, uh, is the value that we need to have in our lab. Like, like we expect here, our lab is, uh, this value is greater than this value. So this shows that our lab, uh, our dispersion is higher, okay? This value is, uh, is recommended by, by uh, some publications, okay? So, so all of those all of those results are for the same stove for a reference stove so that you test it over for the time. same stoves uh, you need to to select a, a reference stove in, in your lab the more experience uh, that you have with that stove the, the stove that you are using in your country more frequently mm -hmm. okay so with that with that stoves you have historical data and with historical data you can found this is laboratory uh, dispersion that's the definition of this value. And this is the theoretical, this is the recommended value for your lab. This is, okay? Uh, like I said, I, I have all the, the, the papers and the, the recommended uh, publication for this. And how many reference stoves, just one reference stove, or do you have a few different reference uh, stoves? Uh, it depends on your, your, uh, your country. By example, in Peru, they, has, they have um, maybe 20, 30, 35 stoves disseminate, disseminated in, in Peru. So they, they, want, they need to use the, the, most, uh, the most used value. Good. So are you able to use this data as well to pinpoint places where the causes of dispersion are happening, be it operator variability or changes in the quality of the fuel or yeah. weather conditions this are you able to hone in on what's causing the, the changes and address them? We're talking about the, 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 the dispersion of all the lab, including the staff of the lab, including the environmental condition, including the procedures of calibration, including all your lab. This is a value to know how is your dispersion, including all the, all the terms of your, all the variables of your, of your lab. So, uh, but uh, this is the most important result here. And then with, with this result, I can, I can build a control chart, okay? This is, this is the high value of the control chart. And we have a very low value, that's because it's not here, but we have a central value. This is only for, um, uh, thermal efficiency for cold, maybe. And then, this is new testing values. This is with historical values, the bounds, and this is new values. So, okay, uh, you, are, you are doing a test for a new, uh, a new, a new system, a new stove, and you, you can put the, the value here 
and you can know if you are good or you are out of your bounds, of your historical bounds. Okay. And that's, that's the, the way that you can control your results that include your procedures, that include your staff, that include your materials, that include your equipment, all that, all the things you can see here and you can say, okay, this value is out of my reference level, so I need to repeat the test. How often do you go and test the reference how, stove? How, how often? often? Uh, how many times a year? Or oh, the, when the, the, you, your yeah. reference value? Um, the best way is with six months. Okay? You have six, mon six months of historical value. You, you can use that value for construct this chart. Six months. And the next six months, you can, uh, you can move this value with new reference uh, historical data. I don't know if you, it's okay to respond. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm just curious about your, your process there, because I think this, this issue is going to be related to um, some, of the dis some of the discussions. I have a mic okay. already. Some of the discussions this afternoon on round robin testing. How do we not only do this at one testing center, but also do it across multiple testing centers? Is there a set of stoves globally that we can make sure we're getting comparable results from center to center, but also have each center have a, a suite of, or a set of reference stoves that they can go back and check against when they need to? And we, we have to work out the details, but I think that's the general idea. And Elmar had, is a mic nearby? Um, regarding um, calibration, we don't have any chance yet, any possibility to calibrate the emission testing. We just calibrate our balances. This is all that we do. But uh, uh, regarding the um, variability and the quality, um, it is very important to have clear that we are not testing stoves, but we are testing cooking system from the fuel with the stove with the pot and the tester. And in our environment, especially, the fuel is the most important reason for variabilities. Um, now we have some solar dryers and we have also electric oven to dry things, but it doesn't, for us and for our clients, it does not make sense, much sense, that we work with, uh, we tested mainly charcoal stoves up to now, um, that we test these stoves with a dried, oven dried or solar dried um, uh, charcoal because the, the clients don't have this type of charcoal. So we are trying to test the, with a with the, uh, charcoal that is available on the market. And the humidity, this is the only parameter we can, we can test up to now, is um, changing a lot. Therefore we have a lot of variability <coughs> and we have to live with this variability. Now, what is quality? Um, I, I think quality depends on what I tell my client, what I tested. Um, so therefore, m in most cases, we just report relative, relative values to say this stove with this char uh, charcoal has relatively to this uh, stove this performance. Um, to a so we avoid to, to, to need to characterize ex exactly the, the fuel. Yeah, that's it. Uh, just for, to finish this, and um, we have the, the, same gr the same chart for almost all parameters that we need. The, the efficiency energy for hot and we have for uh, all the all the index coming from water volume. So, so this is uh, our procedure that we are using now in Peru and Bolivia to control the quality of our results coming from water volume test. This can be applied to emission. What we need to work later for with the results. Okay, so it's just an example. Thank you. Victor has a raise his hand. 
Para crear esta tabla, este histórico, ahí tienes 13 datos, pero ¿habría un mínimo de recomendable para poder encontrar cuál es tu dispersión de laboratorio? The procedure, the international procedure for this example, uh, recommends 11 value, at least historical data, coming from your lab for one stove, for the typical stove. Okay. So you can use your, your plancha stove, the Pazzari stove, and you can use the historical data coming from six months ago, and you can select 11 value, and to put Only the chart is ready. You, you, you need to change only the values, and you have the, the chart ready. I'm, I'm going first. Then. I would like to make one request. I hear David says he found a place to get calibration gases. One thing Aprovecho is trying to do is collect sources for where people can get gases, because that's a big challenge we've been having. So I would make a request that as people have doing searches or finding sources, please relay those to, uh, to us, or at least try for us all to try to create a some type of uh, you know, document that creates where we have possibility, because that's very important. I, I just have a question. I, I didn't understand what's on the y-axis of your plot. Sorry. What is on the, the y-axis of your plot? Oh, okay, yeah. The y-axis is the, is the dispersion of the measurement. The dispersion of the, yes. Standard deviation of the measure of the three of the three results coming from your water volume test. The three results you have in standard deviation, and that's the the x y. Okay. This is the standard deviation. Mm -hmm. By example, this is for five power coming from hot. Okay. This is your standard deviation. Uh, oh, see, if you have a high value, you have a high dispersion. So you need to repeat your, your water volume test. Or to improve um, uh, a water volume test uh, again to have more data and less dispersion. But you, with you, you can detect visually you will fail. You can control very, very fast. question. Uh, so you said you need to collect about six months of historical data to establish your control chart. Yeah. I think Rainey's question may have been how often do you, do you uh, need to check do you every once every week or once every month or every, how often do you need to check to make after, sure? That after, to, after this chart, mm -hmm. okay, you, you have historical data coming from six months, you select the best value with a procedure that we call the, the Grubbs test, the Grubbs test. I don't know if you know. This is a statistical test to, to select the best value in, in, in a historical, in a population of values. You can select the best values with this test, Grubbs test, okay? Then, with six months of data, we have this chart. Okay. Now, the next, uh, the next six, six months, I'm working with new water volume test, and we have these points. This is new points, which uh, that is uh, that we are using. We are using the historical data to analyze these new points. Okay, we were working here maybe six months again, and the next year. You can use the last six months to build another chart. Okay? But the point is that you are, you are controlling your data, your results, to, to have less dispersion each time. Each time you have less dispersion because you, because you are controlling your results. So we expect that the next chart, in, in the next chart, we can have the the, value, the bones or uh, more hearts. 
smaller. They're because you are, you are improving your system or your test each time. So I have a question for, again for the plot. Are those X's, are those, uh, is that an average from, from a series? It's so like the second point on the X axis is actually three tests? Yeah. Okay. One point is three tests. And you have the standard deviation. And this is the date of the test. Yeah. Okay. Do you also plot not just the standard deviation, but the value as well to see how much it deviates yeah. over time? Each, each point or the uh, No, I instead of plotting the standard deviation of the results, plot the, the mean of the three tests over time to see if that, that is staying within. Does that make sense? No, uh, this, uh, this quantum chart is related with the dispersion of the test, not with the mean value of the test. It's related with the dispersion. We, if, we, if we have measurement of the dispersion, we know how good is the test. If we, if we got less dispersion, it's a good test. If we have high dispersion, it's a bad test. The mean value don't say that. The mean value is not uh, a good uh, number to analyze. Well, it's so it's analyzing something else. It's about whether your your result is for the same stove. Is it consistent mm -hmm. over time? I think yeah. that's that's what I'm asking about. Okay, and I don't know. Was asking is essentially this. Um, we'll say that this is the the average value. And these are your tests. If you look at just the standard deviation between these two groups, the standard deviation is equal. But the actual values are significantly different. And so she's asking if you also do the same type of analysis, but on the actual um, average values to see if there are these types of difference between the results. Yes. <coughs> okay. Uh, this this uh, procedure is related with uh, dispersion, standard deviation. Okay. So we have another procedure to analyze the the value, the the average value. This is related with uncertainty measurement, and I can show you later this. But we have another another procedure. We're using Monte Carlo simulation to to analyze the uncertainty of the of the value, and we we can compare this with uh, with uh, with the mean value of the historical data of the stove. Okay, this is only for mm -hmm. the the dispersion. That's in, in the in the water boiling test. Uh, I don't know if you you remember. We have a column of COB. COB value, and this is uh, a new way to analyze this column, the COB. <coughs> this is a visual tool to analyze the COB. And we are analyzing now the COB, only the dispersion, the standard deviation. It's possible to analyze the COB here in the Y axis, because we can we can divide this by the average. We can analyze the COB, but we are using only the dispersion to, to know if we need to repeat the test or not. Okay. Yeah, I think this is something that we should definitely keep in mind as we have our discussions this afternoon for what do we want to put into place in each of our locations to do these checks on the results to all, and also on the procedures as well over time. And I, I also want to make a comment on the, the style of the discussion. The week really is scheduled to be mostly people sharing their ideas back and forth. So please feel free to jump in. Um, and then also for, for people who need help with translation, um, we do want to pause. And actually what I do want to do now is to ask people who speak 
Spanish and French to help me translate what I just said um, so that we can be clear that just the way Victor, when he spoke and he, he spoke in Spanish and then someone else translated, that's, that's the kind of environment that we want to have, a free-flowing discussion. We'll switch from language to language, but we want to make sure everyone is, is following. <laughs> Si vous avez des questions et que vous ne savez pas comment les poser en anglais, il ne faut pas hésiter à les poser en français. Et on traduira pour vous. Pour ceux qui parlent en espagnol, donc, sentez se libre de parler avec fluidité en son idioma et me disent à moi ou à l'ingénieur ou à quelqu'un qui peut traduire. Y cualquier duda o cualquier comentario que tengan, solo lo mencionan y nosotros lo traducimos. Ok. Merci, gracias.